So very exciting times for Imperial Knight players today. Lots of exciting news on this one. Detachment and faction abilities that give you more raw damage and defence. There's still going to be plenty of strong synergy between your big knights and your little ones. And perhaps most scary of all, there's a great big valiant harpoon going around that looks like it might actually be worth the points investment now. The vehicles aren't going to like it much, with the potential to hand out 12 mortal wounds. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking about the faction focus for Imperial Knights, for lots of interesting previews to our big knightly nobles. Before we start, I just thought I'd say a quick thank you to Bricky the other day for giving me a shout out for my video on the 10th edition rules. I'm sure it's not exactly a name that needs a shout out, given that he's a much bigger YouTuber than the likes of me. Well done from Adeptus Ridiculous, among all his other videos, but he's also been covering all of these previews in parallel over on his channel. I'll leave a link to his last faction preview over on his. Always good to see these sort of things covered in different styles. Thoroughly worth a watch, he is a silky smooth presenter. In any case, really appreciate the shout out the other day, man. It was very nice of you. And I must admit, there's a fair bit more to be positive about, at least compared with a few of the other faction previews. A lot of this looks like really quite good news for the army in terms of fun, flavorful rules that add a bit of meaningful power. As always with these previews, we definitely can't interpret army power or anything like that at the moment. We just don't have enough information. Knights still could be super strong or super weak depending on points costs, but at least these rules give us a very good flavor as to how they'll play. First up, one thing that I really quite like is that they've confirmed that Bondsman abilities and Ion Shields for the Dominus are still going to be a thing in 10th edition Knights. I feel like they're really quite nice rules in 9th, as it actually encourages you to build an army of big nobles leading their vassals around, and have a bit more of a balanced knight army as maybe one of the most optimal setups. I feel like the Imperial Knights maybe did that better than the Chaos Knights. A lot of their top armies these days tend to revolve around War Dog spam, which isn't the way that most knight players generally want to play the faction ideally. Sounds like the Bondsman abilities and the Ion Shields will be more on their data sheets, though I guess it's not impossible they could be stratagems. Unfortunately though, this preview didn't show off the standard Quest Doris or the standard Dominus, so we're still waiting on those. From Games Workshop's free text hints, it looks like the Paladin gives out lethal hits and the Lance ability, the weapon keywords for the plus one to wound on the charge. I guess that would be pretty good for Warglaives or maybe the Helverins with their fairly low strength auto cannons. And apparently the Gallant will allow you to re-roll charges and hit rolls, presumably for melee weapons, I would guess given that it's a combat beast. We don't know how many knights they're going to be able to affect, might be one or multiple. I'm glad to see meaningful buffs though. I feel like knights were just a bit more of a boring army to play when positioning didn't really matter, and every single unit was its own isolated little island, basically. For knights in general though, a lot of things seem to have stayed pretty similar. They still get involves at range, but not against melee. They've got similar sort of movement and wound characteristics, the toughnesses have been stretched a bit as per 10th edition, with the armagers going to toughness 10 and Questorish to toughness 12, though I am kind of interested to see just how efficient knights will be against all the rules that we've seen so far. As I'll be talking about in a future video on the channel, I feel like a lot of armies have got things like lethal hits or very specific anti-vehicle mechanics. I think it's really hard to call whether vehicles are going to wind up being weak or strong in this edition. It is going to come down to points costs. Getting into the meat of the previews though, and we've got quite a lot of stuff, their army rule is the Code Chivalric, and a bit simplified compared with the previous, though it still seems nice. It still looks like they've got a super heavy walker rule on their datasheet, which I don't think they've clarified. I guess it will be for stepping over things like infantry in-game. That's what it does at the moment. Their launch detachment is going to be called the Noble Lance. This one feels a bit like Tyrannus in the old book. A 6 plus feel no pain, and the ability to improve it to a 5 plus if you complete your Chivalric Code Ds. And then a usual mix of stratagems, weapons, and datasheets. Two stratagems. Two weapons including a spectacularly scary Thundercoil Harpoon, and then a couple of data sheets, one for the Armager Warglaives and one for Canis Rex. Starting out with the big stuff though, and their army wide rule is going to be called Code Chivalric. Again, it's a fairly slimmed down version, like quite a lot of these army wide special rules from 9th. Now it's a mechanic where you pick one of two of these at the start of the game. I believe this will be after you've seen your opponent's army. Then the buff comes in two different parts. First up, you get an oath ability that your entire army gets, so a nice increase in either speed or damage it would seem. And then after that, you get a deed mission, where it's a hard objective, but if you complete it, you get 3 CP, probably fairly late in the game though. I suspect on average, it will wind up to less overall strength compared with the previous code. That one basically netted you a crazy 5 CP, as well as some other very, very good buffs, so I'm not really surprised that that was toned down a fair bit. It still looks like it adds loads of strength though. The choice of deeds are these two, either Lay Low the Tyrant or Reclaim the Realm. For Lay Low the Tyrant, I must admit the wording is just a little bit ambiguous there in my opinion. It says that each time the model is selected to shoot or fight, re-roll a hit roll of 1 and a wound roll of 1. 
Now that could mean one of two different things to my mind. Either it means that you roll a single hit roll of one and a single wound roll of one each time the model fights, or that it means that you get to re-roll those hit rolls and wound rolls of one for every single attack that you make. For things like Space Marine Captains in the past, I think it was a bit more obvious, as that would be phrased as each time the model makes an attack, you get to re-roll a hit and wound of one, and that one would apply to every single dice, as basically every single dice is its own attack. This though sounds like it probably applies to when the entire model gets to shoot or fight, not individual attacks, so I'd guess it might just be the one hit and the one wound of one for the entire model, not literally all of them. I'll be interested to hear your guys' interpretations down in the comments though, Certainly if it's all of them, it would be spectacularly on balance with the other one. I think you'd rarely ever want the extra movement over that crazy damage boost. Still though, even if it is the less powerful version, it's still going to be excellent on things like thermal spears or other high power anti-tank weapons. Gives you a bit of insurance against rolling those dreaded low numbers. In any case, the other part of that deed is that you complete it if you've killed the enemy warlord. Definitely not super likely to happen, as the opponent will generally want to keep them safe, but if the enemy is playing an army where they want to play kind of aggressive, it is going to happen from time to time, and you'll net 3 CP, maybe even early-ish in the game in some cases. Then finally the other one is called Reclaim the Realm, this one gives you plus 1 to your move characteristic, and plus 1 to advance and charge rolls as well. A decently solid movement boost, I feel like that could be reasonable enough to trade out with if it's just the individual hits and wounds of 1, particularly for a melee army that really wants to make some long charges go off. Could be super powerful if there's still a mechanic to advance and charge in the codex, maybe the errant will still hand that out to their warglaives. In general though, I think I'd probably usually take the damage, that does seem quite nice on thermal spears. Otherwise, the deed I think is probably harder than the warlord for the most part. You've got to try and control a marker in the enemy deployment zone, not undoable, but seems less likely than the warlord for the most part. Generally, enemy deployment zone objectives tend to be absolutely fortified, and if you manage to get one of your knights into there, then it's probably going very, very well already. Still though, it is something that's going to occasionally happen late game. I think out of these two, my first instincts would be to go lay low the tyrant. I'm just not quite sure that that extra movement buff does enough to outweigh the damage, but if you are going for short range melee type things, then maybe it could be worth it. Otherwise, we've got the knightly detachment rule, which is called the noble lance, this one gives you a 6 plus feel no pain, so a nice simple durability boost there. Perhaps surprisingly straightforward for a 10th edition faction ability, this one will give you effectively a 20% durability boost compared with not having the rule. I guess compared with Alteranis, it has now been improved a bit as it also affects mortal wounds now. It did mean that their knightly households were particularly susceptible to mortal wounds as it also cuts through your ion shields. Interestingly enough, if you do manage to do your chivalric deed from the first bit, so either slay the warlord or take that home objective, then you get a pretty spectacular durability boost that goes all the way up to a 5 plus feel no pain, shrugging off a third of wounds inflicted on your army from then on. That really is massive, compared with not having the rule, that's effectively a 50% durability boost. Or relative to just having the 6 plus version, it's an extra 25%. I know there's going to be some people calling me up on those numbers, but they are right, I'm just talking in relative terms comparing the rules. Overall, this does seem like a very simple and very usable detachment rule. Imperial Knights often tend to be exposed to enemy firepower as they can't hide all that much, it means that durability can often be a lot more important than damage for them, as generally they're an army full of big scary guns anyway, they just need to be able to survive to fire them once they manage to get the opponent out of terrain and things. Tyrannus was certainly very very popular in 9th. Next up we've got a couple of fun guns, and perhaps in a bit of a surprise, the rapid fire battle cannon actually literally gains the rapid fire keyword, so extra shots at half range. The base profile for this thing is kind of similar to the Lehman Ross battle cannon, Strength 10, AP minus 1, and damage 3. And while I think that that profile was really quite underwhelming on the Lehman Ross itself, if they don't have another way to get more shots into it, the fact that this hits on 3s and also basically gets double the shots within 36 inch range, I feel like that really turns the table and makes it very useful. Compared with previously, I still don't think it's going to be quite as good a general purpose weapon. AP minus 2 hurts against high save things, and Strength 10 will be wounding tougher tanks on a 5 plus now, not a 4. But the sheer amount of shots that you throw at the enemy does mean that you're fairly likely to get some good results. On average, with the new profile, it looks like you kill around about 3 or 4 Primaris Intercessors, 2 or 3 Terminators, you still get to wound on 2+, plus versus their Toughness 5 these days, around 9 wounds to a Rhino, so they're still decently effective against light vehicles despite AP-1, but then it really drops off a whole load against tougher tanks, so Toughness 12 Repulsors and Land Raiders, you're not really doing all that much comparatively. Still though, I feel like this is good news for the Paladin, I feel like you're normally going to be able to get that within rapid fire range, 36 inches isn't a short range by any stretch of the imagination. 
I feel like perhaps one of the biggest and most headline news bits of this whole preview is the Great Big Thunder Coil Harpoon though. This one's the scary gun on the Night Valiant, and throughout its history it's almost always just been far too unreliable to be really quite good, particularly on a Dominus Knight that needs to get very close to the enemy. I feel like with these kind of stats though, Games Workshop might have finally done enough to actually make it be worth taking, though obviously, depending on how they cost the Night Valiant, that could change. It seems that the new profile for it hits on a 2 plus against everything now, not just against vehicles, and this seems absolutely excellent with that reroll ones mechanic, means that you could be 2 plus rerolling ones, and then also rerolling those ones to wound as well, so you don't have to spend command points there. Means that you're spectacularly likely to get the wound, and when you do it gets even better. It's a crazy strength 24, AP minus 6 and damage 12, which sounds amazing but maybe isn't enormously different to how it was before. It did have a reputation for being very hit and miss, bouncing off invul saves, or just failing to hit and wound as you wouldn't normally have those rerolls. Now though, it's got the combination of anti-monster and anti-vehicle on a 4 plus, but also devastating wounds as well. This means that in effect against those targets, every wound roll of a 4 plus is going to dish out 12 mortal wounds instead of its regular damage, blasting straight through invul saves and straight through regular saves, and pretty much guaranteeing a dead normal sized vehicle or monster. This really looks exceptionally brutal to me, and I think it's going to be a big fear factor having this unit in your army, and making your opponent really not want to put big heavy targets into the midfield, otherwise things might work out badly. Maybe this is the sort of weapon that actually needs it, seeing as it's short range, not on the fastest knight in the world, and the big one shot would often just ping off invul saves, and the opponent would command re-roll them, so it would never really do anything. But I must admit at the same time, this might be how we get the new ignore invul saves type things for 10th edition, a mechanic that seemed to have gone away quite a bit. Basically this thing gets ignores invuls on a roll of a 4+, plus. might not be the best news in everyone's opinion, seeing as the Votan Railgun now only seems to get that on a 6, and certain demon demigods like Bellicor's Shadowy Sword and Scarbrand's melee attacks, they all lost it. Let me know what you think though. I feel like given the Valiant's history of generally struggling with short range engagements and not really tending to do much in the past, it might not be the worst to actually make it playable. Next up we've got a couple of stratagems, one for 2cp is Shoulder the Burden, this one's usable any command phase for a knight, it's got to be a knight that's lost a wound previously in the game, and it basically just gives your knight an all round buff in all sorts of ways, plus one to your move, toughness, save, leadership, objective control, and plus one to the hit roll as well. I think for 2cp it is at least fairly pricey for that, the bits that I'd focus on out of that list of buffs are the plus one save and plus one toughness, that will make the knight harder to remove, particularly on something like a Questorus being targeted by las cannons, should flip them from a 4 plus to wound to a 5. I think the plus 1 to hit is very nice as well, could potentially counter the degrading mechanics for knights for a turn, or could just give a very scary knight quite a meaningful damage boost. Overall I'd say that this one is usable but really quite pricey at 2 CP when command points are going at a premium. I'd guess that as a result it probably won't get used quite as much compared with other stratagems that the knights might get access to. I feel like this one could be a particularly good target for anything like the free stratagem options like Canis Rex seems to get now, or if that's present on any other units. I suppose it could be good to burn some CP as well if you happen to complete your chivalric Ds. The other knightly stratagem again is a kind of interesting one called Trophy Claim. This one's the one for taking down vehicles and monsters and things, and you basically use it as a 1 CP one in the shooting or fight phase when your model attacks a monster or vehicle. The damage buff that it gives is a nice effective plus 1 to wound, really not a bad mechanic at all, and that will have really quite a lot of power on things like that rapid fire battle cannon that would normally be wounding them on a 5. The damage buff really isn't too bad at all, though it's interestingly got some sort of regen mechanic built into it as well basically meaning that if your unit can target an enemy vehicle and it does actually kill it with the attacks that you use this stratagem for, then you actually get to gain a command point as well. So you've kind of just used this stratagem basically for free. I think in reality that might be a little bit hard to pull off. If you were going to kill the enemy unit anyway, then you might not have necessarily needed this stratagem to do so, but it seems like really quite a nice one to add in as insurance, basically make sure that enemy vehicle is well and truly dead. It's also interesting that if you fail to kill the vehicle in those attacks, then after all is done, you can't use this stratagem again. Overall, it's a bit cheaper at one command point. Again, I suspect that this will definitely be used against certain targets. I feel like something big like a Crusader all covered in guns will really love this, plus one to wound in any way that you can get it is really meaningful. I feel like a Knight Castellan would absolutely adore this as well. Finally, we've got a couple of data sheets, and starting off we have the Armager Warglaives. I'd say the general feel of these guys is pretty similar. They're probably the knights that you want on the front line, and I suspect that the Bondsman abilities that you give them are going to be really quite big. They might well have lost the minus one damage from those though. 
First up, I noticed on this data sheet it looks like you can no longer take squadrons of them unless that's on the other side with the army construction, but they are battle lines so you could still take six of them if you wanted. I guess in some ways that could be worse if you wanted to hard spam these and take nine of them. Most of the time though I think that would be a bit excessive even for a very good data sheet and now you will be able to take six of them and actually deploy them individually and not have to squadron them up at the start of the game. Otherwise they've got objective control eight, kind of feels in a similar place to five model obsec that they had before. The obsec definitely gave them an advantage but now they count as more models so a bit of a trade off there I guess. Only leadership seven is pretty bad but I'd guess that that might well improve for the bondsman abilities maybe, that would kind of make sense to me. Ion shields still appear to be just against range and not against melee, so I suppose that means that knights are going to retain their characteristic of being easier to kill in combat. And then we've got a few tweaks to their weapon profiles. The Questorus Iron Hail Stubber loses a shot. The Chain Cleaver loses a pip of AP on both its profiles, but gains strength 8 on the sweep mode, which isn't too bad. It will now be wounding things like Intercessors on A2+, which is quite nice. And then the Thermal Spear still looks like a very fearsome anti-tank weapon. It has come down in range from 30 inches down to 24, but now it's two shots hitting on threes, strength 12, AP 4, and damage D6. And perhaps most terrifyingly though, it's got the melt of four keywords. I think that's the first time that we've seen that in these previews, where basically you'd get four extra damage if you make a failed save against this within half range. Really quite brutal, though I suppose you do have to be really close at 12 inches to get that buff. Finally, their special rule is Impetuous Glory. On the charge, they get sustained hits one, so exploding sixes to hit there. Nice and simple and effective. I feel like the Armada Warglaives are probably going to be the best users of that reroll one to hit and wound rule. It's really quite powerful on things like the Chain Cleaver and that Thermal Spear. Finally, GW have chosen to show off Canis Rex in the only Imperial Knight special character. It's definitely an interesting one, but I kind of feel I would have preferred to see a regular Questorus or Dominus, as this one doesn't appear to have any Bondsman abilities listed on him, so we still don't know exactly how they're handed out. For his raw stats, he still moves 10 inches. Looks like Knights have got Toughness 12 now on the Questorus chassis, but have dropped their wounds to 22 a little. Still going to be very tough to take out, and need some dedicated anti-tank weapons. His objective control is 10, so a little better than an individual Warglaive now. If he takes a bunch of wounds, then he gets two degrees down to objective control 5 though. He's got a great big leadership of 5+, plus, about as good as it gets in the game. At a notice, as expected, he does have that towering keyword, so it means that the big Questorus Knights aren't going to be hiding behind terrain. As before, his damage output really is quite meaty. His Freedom's Hand Power Fist gets a strength 20, AP 3 and damage 9 once more. Really quite brutal. And the Laz Impulsor feels like it's got a pretty similar sort of feel to how it did before. Still a great big anti-tank weapon at close -ish range, strength 14 and damage 4 there. For Canis Rex's abilities, it seems that you get a free strat per turn which I think is absolutely crazy value on a big super heavy walker like an Imperial Knight. Even things like command rerolls for saves or wound rolls on the Laz Impulsor will have some big value, never mind any of the actual knightly stratagems or anything else that's got high value. Seems that it's once every turn and not once every battle round as well, which is huge, and he can even double up on stratagems that have been used elsewhere in the army. I feel like unless he's costed absolutely crazily higher than all the other knights, it's going to be very tempting for this rule alone. Otherwise, it seems like his other special rule is that he's got a higher chance of critical hits on a 5+. plus. That pairs with sustained hits on everything, which I think is just relative to his datasheet alone. I don't think that the other Imperial Knights will be getting that. It basically means that every time this guy hits on a 5 or 6, though, you get an extra hit on your foe. Finally, he still retains the ability to get Sir Hector out, which is listed on the back of this card, apparently. Really quite cool, that's still a thing, and it feels like quite a neat and stylish way of doing that. You can see he's actually got his war gear options and unit composition on this side, not that it really adds all that much. Obviously, if they still cost him into the stratosphere with points, then he's still not going to be that good, but I feel like just looking at this data sheet makes me feel like he's adding a whole load of raw power just by himself, even if he's not adding synergy. will be interesting to see how he stacks up against the other knights, but I feel like if you're wanting to add one big super heavy knight to your army, then he could be a really good choice. As before, it looks like a lot of his strength comes from his data sheet, and he could just go to town on core book stratagems from that command point thing, maybe just give him a whole bunch of command rerolls over the game. Overall, I'd say that that's a pretty positive looking faction preview for the Imperial Knights. They do seem to have kept a lot of their flavour, doing oaths, having one of their best household mechanics still kept in with their detachments, and fairly impressive looking stratagems and gun stats that we've seen so far. As always, let me know what you think though. Are you happy with these changes, or are you less so? Look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, where I'll certainly keep the regular 40k reviews coming. I do tend to post new things just about every day. 
Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel and you'd like to help support, I'd just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description below if you'd like to help keep these videos coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.